Welcome back, honors. Welcome back to welcome back to your flip classroom and our new discussion about the Reformation. Well, sort of new, not really new. You've been learning about this already quite a bit in your religion classes, right? So the big thing about it that we need to understand is we are now expanding that whole concept, right? We're moving into the historic realm, the political realm, past the theological realm that you've been learning with Mr. Madrano and Mr. Mathern, and we're now getting into more of an in-depth discussion about it, right? We're getting into more of this stuff about why the these things were happening. What was going on with the church in the 12 and the 13 and the 1400s going into the 1500s when the Reformation would ultimately break out in 1517? Why had it not started earlier? Why is it going to be so chaotic when it does start? How much violence is going to occur because of this war? Are there going to be multiple other Protestants other than just Martin Luther? All the answers to those things are going to be coming up in this unit, right? So the big thing about it, though is let's go ahead and start a fresh new slice of notes, right? A new slice of paper. I like saying slice because it weirds y'all out. A new sheet of paper or something like that where you're going to title this Unit 6, The Reformation and Exploration, right? We're going to get through as much of the Reformation as the period of exploration as we possibly and humanly can, and then that's what's going to be on your last test going into your exam, right? So going into it, though, let's go ahead and get it all started off, right? The thing about it that we're now talking about, though, first is the Reformation. Like I said, you're going to be getting much more of that historical, political, and also that kind of uh, what other stuff was going down, kind of deeper understanding of it now, right? So the big thing about it to start off with is that the Reformation is going to be a big, very large movement, okay, that is going to be catalyzed by the Renaissance, okay? So something you're going to notice almost immediately is that the Renaissance is going to be the driving force behind the period of exploration, and then also during the Reformation as well. Now, chronologically speaking, we should be talking about the exploratory or exploration period first, right? Because it actually began in the 1460s, and this movement that we're going to talk about didn't start until the 1500s. However, Mr. Terry likes to talk about the Reformation first, because you can kind of really, really see the connection of the Renaissance to the Reformation if you just think humanism, right? Humanism, humanism, humanism. That word that a lot of y'all did not appreciate enough going into this last test that word, the idea of studying secular things, things around us, understanding the world around us, asking questions, right? Humanists love to ask questions. What that's going to do, though, is it's going to lead people to begin to question the central force in their lives, right? Humanist thinking of the Renaissance era is going to push people to really, really bear in and dig into all of these different concepts that are revolving around them, right? And the biggest force in their life that they begin to actually question is that thing that rose to power during the high middle ages it's none other than the church right so what we need to understand a little bit is that the protestant reformation is going to be a movement that is going to lead to the split in western europe and led to the create or wait excuse me blah, 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 blah. led to the split of the church in western europe and is going to lead to the creation of many new churches and denominations of christianity right so we have two really important buzzwords in that whole little paragraph, description, bullet point, whatever you want to call it. We got the word Protestant and we got the word denominations, right? We're going to talk about both those words here in about two seconds, okay? But what this basically means is much like the Great Schism of 1053 that actually, yeah, 1053, that occurred in the Byzantine and led to the splitting of the church into Catholic and Eastern Orthodox, right? We're going to see yet another schism that's going to lead to the growth of new denominations of Christianity, all right? So like now, the thing we need to understand though is what's the difference between a religion versus a denomination and then we're also going to give this word protestant a little bit more of a definition as well right so going into it something we need to understand is that christianity is the overall umbrella okay i really like to talk about like I don't know why, for some reason, I use like the metaphor of umbrellas all the time to refer to this stuff. But umbrellas are basically like these things that protect you from all of this rain, right? And Christianity is our very first one. Well, what's going to happen is a major storm is going to come along in 1053 and lead to the first splitting into two new umbrellas of like religion. You're going to have your Roman Catholicism and your Eastern Orthodox, right? Eastern Orthodox being primarily practiced by people in like places like Greece, Russia, and areas of Eastern Europe, right? Now, Roman Catholicism, on the other hand, is going to relocate itself and be headquartered in the city of Rome. It is going to then also now present day as well, or present day as well, be located in the Vatican and it will emanate out of that location, right? Now the Roman Catholic Church though is going to see a massive schism starting in 1517 
led by the movements of Martin Luther, right? So the thing that we need to understand, though, is it didn't really cause a schism in the Roman Catholic Church, more of a breaking away, right? So what's going to end up happening is you're going to see another split, right? And it's going to turn into now the Roman Catholic Church and then another word that we use as an umbrella term to refer to a large group of new people. And they're known as Protestants, right? Now, the key thing that I'm trying to drive home with this entire concept is that Protestants are Christians, okay? I don't know how many times I have to explain this to kids every single year. But Christianity is not the thing that we're actually arguing right now. We're not arguing anything, actually. We're trying to define something. Christianity is a very large religion. And there are a lot of groups of different types of Christians. And the three that you see listed on the screen right now are Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholic, and Protestants, right? Martin Luther was a Protestant. John Calvin was a Protestant. Ulrich Zwingli was a Protestant, right? Protestant just simply means that it's a type of Christian emanating out of Western Europe that's not a Catholic, right? Mr. Terry was raised Protestant, right? Protestant. I was raised Protestant because I was a Baptist, right? Coming out of the Anabaptist movement following the movements of Ulrich Zwingli, right? And all of that will actually start with the Protestant Reformation that begins in 1517, right? Now, there's two words that we need to understand though, okay? Protestant, which literally they were protesting the Catholic Church, so they created new churches. But the thing about it is, is that there are a lot of different types of Protestant, y'all. There's a ton of different types of Protestants. Lutherans, Pentecostals, Methodists, Episcopalians, Baptists, Seventh-day Adventists, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, Calvinists, which includes Huguenots, Puritans, Presbyterians, and so many more. This list is actually a very limited one of ones that I was just thinking of off the top of my head, right? So when we're looking at this, though, you have to understand that all of these different groups and Catholicism as well are considered different denominations, right? So a Protestant, the word that we use right here, is a Christian that is not a Catholic, whereas a denomination is a smaller subgroup of Christianity, not necessarily Protestant or Catholic. It's just referring to one of the groups themselves. Like, for example, there are so many different denominations of Christianity, which include Protestant denominations as well as Catholicism. Protestant, though, of course, is going to be related to the breaking off of new churches that started in 1517. Do you see what I'm talking about there? That's two words you need to understand the difference between, because without that understanding, you can't understand the political aspects of all this shenanigans that's about to go down, right? But what we need to understand, though, is what's going to now lead to these different concepts, right? What is going to lead to Martin Luther doing his thing, writing the 95 Thesis, getting out there, trying to reform the church, never intentionally starting a new church, by the way. That was never a part of his plan. But the thing that we need to understand about it, though, is that the church in the 1400s, the church that actually would raise Luther, the church that Luther himself would join when he was a young man in the late 1400s, had fallen subject to a lot of corruption, right? Catholicism in the 1400s was getting really, really dicey, okay? Mostly due to the fact that there were a lot of corrupt activities going on within the church during the Middle Ages, and then also that's going to carry over into the Renaissance, right? Now, we need to understand a couple of things about this, though. At no point is Mr. Terry, he wants to put this out there 110%, is at any point is Mr. Terry talking about the modern day Catholic Church? No. Am I saying that there's anything wrong with the Catholic faith itself? No. Before I get some kind of angry phone call, right? Am I saying that there's anything wrong with the way that the church currently functions? No. Am I saying that there's anything wrong with the way that the church used to function or its foundational principles? No. What I'm saying is that there were a lot of negative individuals involved in the church that led it down certain corrupt paths and that the church accepted certain actions during the Middle Ages and going into the Renaissance that were in itself corrupt, wrong, and go against scripture, right? So when we're looking at this, we need to understand a couple of those examples, right? To name a few of those things, let's start off with the big one, the elephant in the room, Papal supremacy, right? Papal supremacy is a thing that we talk about in the Middle Ages that some of you really get why it's so screwed up and some of you really, really don't, right? So papal supremacy, let's take a chance to reiterate it a little bit, right? So first and foremost, mm, man, that coffee is cheap, but it is good. All right, so here we go. Big thing about papal supremacy is bad popes, okay? Not all popes, but some bad popes. The most famous papal suprematic pope is, of course, going to be none other than Gregory the Seventh, the guy that like made people kiss his feet. Now, the thing about it, though, when we're looking at this, bad popes oftentimes operated a lot more like monarchs of states 
rather than being leaders of a church, right? The reason why we're talking about papal supremacy is that popes are meant to be a lot like Pope Francis is today, offering spiritual guidance, offering anointing of the sick, offering direction at conferences and meetings of fellow Christians that come together to try and understand their faith in a modern world, right? Where they're not supposed to be doing is getting involved in worldly affairs, right? Bad popes, like during this time period, were known to wage war, right? They were known to tax people, and they were known to live very lavish lives much like rulers of their own states, right? A good examples of this papal suprematic like ability though is Gregory the Seventh, a really, really intense pope that like literally fought with other kings to try and make sure that he had more power than they did, right? So keeping in the back of your mind, papal supremacy is a very, very large negative. Julius the Second will be another one. We're going to talk about him in about two seconds, right? The other thing that we need to understand about this as well is that there is a lot of crazy stuff going on in the church. The next thing I'm about to talk about is not necessarily related to papal supremacy, but it's not completely unrelated either. And it's a fun little event I like to talk about called the Cadaver Synod in eight. 97, right? So this is another example of corrupt activities or kind of just goofy, silly activities by the church that really demonstrate to us that they weren't unified in a front that was all about saving lives and saving faith. And this was a political dispute that two popes got into, right? This right here is one of those popes. That's Pope Stephen. And then this right here is Pope Formosus, right? The thing that we need to understand, though, is that the Cadaver Synod in 1897, let's look at those two Excuse me, those two figures. Pope Stephen over here is accusing, pointing, and yelling at Pope Formosus, saying things like, what did you do? Why did you do this? You're a bad person, blah, blah, blah. But the question that some of you are like, Mr. Terry, but I'm a little bit confused. Why are there multiple popes at once? Oh, don't even get me started on that. We're going to get the great Western schism here in a second. But what you need to understand is Pope Formosus is dead. Like So, like, this guy's dead. Like, so he's been dead for a little while, too. He's kind of gushy and stuff like that. What ended up happening in this situation is Pope Stephen politically wanted to put the dead body of Pope Formosus on trial because he didn't like how the people of Rome liked Pope Formosus better than him. So as we can see, this is another element of that papal suprematic power is that literally popes even got into disputes with one another, both former and then latter reigns, right? The thing that is going to go down here is that Pope Stephen is going to yell at this dead body for several hours hire an Italian monk to sit behind the dead body and speak for it. So literally the dead body was just flopped down in the chair and literally they'd be like, do you admit to the crimes of which you're being accused of? And the deacon behind would be like, yeah. Just, it's very, very weird, right? So there was a dead body trial of one pope against another one. That's a pretty good example of church corruption, right? And that's called the Cadaver Synod. Another fun one that's going to go down as well is Julius II. Julius II is the warrior pope from 1503 to 1513 that's going to come right after Alexander VI that is well known for invading Italy multiple different times, brought under his papal reign. And also, the other big thing about it is he's well known for his efforts to beautify the churches within the Vatican, right? Spending millions of dollars on all of this, including the $600,000 that he paid Michelangelo over the course of three years to paint the Sistine Chapel ceiling, right? So the thing we need to understand though as well is that Pope Julius is also going to die from syphilis, which popes aren't supposed to be getting. Now, all right, so now look, but the big thing they're getting into it also is that there were also accounts of inquisition, torture, and execution, right? When we really, really look into it, none other than Joan of Arc herself is going to be burned at the stake by Catholic Church officials from England because there were that many divisions and unregulations within the church itself. That to like some branches of the Catholic Church were aligning more with certain governments and supporting the English during this time period rather than supporting the French, leading to the death of an innocent, right? The other thing about it as well is you're going to see things like the Spanish English Inquisition, which is going to be a really, really bad one. For any of the dads or the moms watching this that are big Monty Python fans, no one expects the Spanish Inquisition. Well, the Spanish Inquisition was literally an effort led by, like, Isabella and Ferdinand of Spain. Like, you might want to jot, like, a little description of this down real quick. Isabella and Ferdinand of Spain were the king and queen of Spain during the 1400s. And they led a campaign known as the Reconquista. And the Reconquista was literally, uh, like, they were, they were the end of the Reconquista, anyway. Uh, when they, like, Spain was taken back from, like, old Muslim kingdoms and other things like that. And what's going to happen when Isabel and Ferdinand both come to power is they decide that they only want Catholics in their country. And so they literally tell everybody who is Muslim or Jewish, get out, either convert, leave, or die. 
pick one, right? And so a bunch of people actually stayed and converted, and they converted to Catholicism. Well, the Spanish Inquisition was then started under, uh, under Isabel and Ferdinand Spain to put those people on trial to make sure they would actually authentically convert it. For example, Jewish people that were formerly Jewish that converted to Catholicism under the reign of Isabel and Ferdinand were called conversos, right? Conversos. And they would literally put them on trial and be like, eat this pork like so like and be like hey you 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 like you still not you fall in kosher rules still da 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 and would accuse them torture them of actually secretly being jewish on the side and lead a campaign based in religion of trying to purify their country which is disgusting the other big one that's going to happen though as well is the great western schism which is going to occur from 1378 to 1417 and what that is is also known as the avignon papacy but to kind of cook that entire idea down into like one bullet point this is another example of church corruption i kid you not y'all there were multiple popes for quite some time right from 1378 to 1417 there were several different popes as many as three to four of them at one time because there would be an italian one and the first one was i think was uh i think it was urban the second i have to look that up but literally like the first one was like i am the real pope i am the italian pope i am against church corruption me and then there was this other guy named clement the seventh that actually lived in france and he was like no i'm the real pope parlez-vous francais and then there was another german one was like ich bin ein pope like so like now the the thing about it, when we understand this whole concept is that really shows us church corruption during the 1400s because it's demonstrating to us that everything was getting so political. And as you can see from this map right here, you can see allegiance to the Avignon Papacy, which is this one right here, which is located in none other than France. You've got allegiance to the one in Rome, and then you had allegiance to the one of others, variables, and stuff like that. It's a very intense time period. And these things were getting so bad, y'all, that Dante himself wrote different priests and like church officials and bishops and cardinals into punishments in his book, The Divine Comedy, right? I kid you not. Like, in The Divine Comedy, Dante looks upon sinners that are being punished in hell, and a lot of them are church officials. This is one of my favorite ones, where he is actually seeing with Virgil, there's Virgil standing with him right there, and that's Dante, and he's looking upon cauldrons that are fiery cauldrons filled with people that are being burned alive, and their feet are being poked by demons, and it's none other than priests that have committed, committed the act of simony. And simony, what that is, is selling church offices to one another to make money. Another big one was nepotism, which is mean they would favor, like the church would favor certain families because of their power and influence. We'll get into that a lot later. We'll talk about Leo X, the Medici Pope. And then also pluralism was a big one as well, where priests were holding multiple offices and then collecting all of the actual, like, the, all of the, whatchamacallit, all of the salaries from them, leading fabulously wealthy lives, right? So as you can tell right there when we're looking at it, we've got a lot of problems in the church like a ton of problems going on in the church but so is it a possibility that we're gonna have some reformers that pop up before martin luther even arrives that actually tried to reform the church of course it is right y'all there's going to be reformers that come around before martin luther right one famous one being john wycliffe who was an english priest that was actually alive during the 1400s who believed that the church had grown far too wealthy and should give up its earthly possessions the thing about it, though, is he wrote these things down in his personal letters. And he never intended anybody to read them, but then he died, right? He died, he was then buried, had a Catholic funeral and stuff like that. Church officials later discovered them, read them, translated them, and then they're like, oh, he wants us to be poor again, screw that. And then what they did is they dug up his body, excommunicated him, and then pitched his ashes in the woods, right? That's mean, like, don't do that, that's rude. Like, like so, and the thing about it, though, is like, literally his body was dug up and burned out of spite, right? Another very famous one was a guy by the name of Jan Huss, right? Jan Huss is probably the most famous early reformer. He's one of my favorite ones to talk about. He's a bohemian reformer, which means he's Czech, right? He's like from like the former Czechoslovakia, the current day Czech Republic. He's the very first big reformer. Came Comes out in the early 1400s as well, and he is a priest that speaks out directly against the immorality of the church. He advocated for receiving the bread and wine at mass. He said priests should be allowed to get married, that this idea of celibacy is silly. He said that the Bible needs to be translated into vernacular languages. <laughs> Notice again that important, all-encompassing word, the word vernacular, right? He believes that the Bible needs to be translated into language that people can actually read. And another big one is he also believes in the abolishing of purgatory. Now, this is going to become, those two right there, those two middle ones, probably need a star or a highlight because they're going to come up real, real big as this whole talk goes on. He wants to get rid of simony. He wants to end any future crusades. He's like got a lot of things he's like 
lashing out against, and he even translated the Bible into Czech, and people began to follow him. So ironically enough, since he died a Catholic, it's hard to kind of put a like finger on what he actually was, but the thing about it is you could argue that he's the very first successful Protestant reformer, because the people that followed him were called Hussites, right? Now going into it, though, the people that followed him and liked him are all going to end up dead. Like now, so what's going to happen, though, is he would be summoned to the Council of Constance in 1415, which was a meeting that was going to be held by the church and by the pope to talk to Jan and be like, yo, Jan, I hear you got some ideas. Let's chat about them. Let's rap about it a little bit, bro. And at the Council of Constance in 1415, they promised Jan Hus, they promised him that they would not hurt him, not abuse him, not arrest him and do any of those things, which was a big fat lie. They literally got him to the Council of Constance, arrested him, put him in front of an inquisition, accused him of heresy, and then had him burned at the stake, right? And they put a paper crown on top of his head to try and make fun of him and mock him as the Pope of his new church, right? What the heck that's so screwed up and so messed up? And the last early reform we have is none other than Desiderius Erasmus, right? Desiderius Erasmus is the father of Christian humanism, and he's one of our earliest reformers in the sense of he actually knew Martin Luther. They actually knew each other, met each other multiple times, wrote letters back and forth to each other. So the big thing about it that we need to understand is that Desiderius Erasmus is the father of Christian humanism. Now, Christian humanism, what that is, is he's the very first guy to take the Renaissance principle of humanism and begin to blend it with Christianity. He believed that Christianity should be a guide to life, not a checklist to get into heaven. So he kind of lashed out against the sacraments quite a bit. He also is going to be like, hey, we should be using the stories in the Bible to understand how to live our lives, not simply going through life being like, all right, did I get baptized? All right, did I do the match for anyone? All right, did I do this? Right? Like, so like then he also said that translating the Bible into vernacular languages is important, so he actually had it translated into Greek. He also exposed the Catholic Church corruption in many of his different works. He had one of his earliest works published known as The Praise of Folly, and The Praise of Folly lashed out against religious fanaticism and also lashed out against several other members of the church. He even went as far as to make fun of the sitting Pope, Julius II, directly saying, oh, you're going to be barred from heaven. Literally, there was a picture of Julius in his book standing outside of the gates of heaven, not allowed to go in because of the sins that he had committed, right? But he never left the Catholic faith, which is a really interesting thing. Even though he knew Martin Luther and saw him start the Reformation, never stopped being a Catholic and died a Catholic, actually, interestingly enough. But anyway, that is going to be your flip for right there. I hope you all enjoyed it. That was really, really probably one of the better ones I've made in a while. But I hope you all enjoyed it, and I'll see you all soon. Y'all have a good one.